Hello everyone, and welcome back. Can you believe it? We're at episode 5 of this T-55 project. In the prior episode, we did a lot of fluids chipping, and they turned out really good. I'm very happy with it. Well, this week, we're going to continue with some chipping using acrylics, the sponge method. We're going to do a little bit of filter painting and regular old-fashioned brush chipping. So let's get started. I suppose the first question is, why would I be doing sponge chipping or brush chipping when I just got done doing hairspray chipping or fluids chipping on this model? Well, for me, the hairspray or fluids chipping provides one type of effect. In this case, a lot of scuffed chipping, and you can see that on a lot of the surfaces, especially on the fuel cans and some of the flat surfaces. But in other areas, I want something that looks a little bit more... I don't know, exposed, I guess is the word, a little more down to the base metal steel. And that's where this type of chipping effect will come in handy. And just a short recap, to do the sponge chipping really less is more. You want to have a very little or limited amount of paint on the sponge. Just want very small little flecks of paint to be distributed on the surface. And so you dip the sponge in some paint, you get the excess off on a paper towel, and then you go ahead and tap it onto your model. Another benefit of using, say, the sponge method along with the tripping fluids is that you have the ability to change the style of the chips and also change the colors of the chips. And so while, say, using the fluids, I was chipping down to a base primer color, using the sponge, I can add, say, a darker gray color and indicate down to the bare metal. And in addition, you could also use, like, say, shades of the base color, maybe a lighter shade of the green, and sponge a little bit of that onto the surface. And that's a real easy way to indicate some scuffs or wear on the surface. And just sneak up on it. So what I like to do is put a round of chips in, a limited number of chips using the sponge. And then what I often do is come back with the paintbrush, and I might enlarge a few of the chips or combine them with other chips to make them a little bit different sizes or shapes. And for situations such as this front fender, well, the paintbrush comes in really handy here because I could take the pre-existing chips by the other methods and I could change their character by adding harder edges, changing the color a little bit perhaps, or adding a little bit of direction or combining them. So it really looks like this was created by impact. Really, the strength in any of these techniques is using them in combination with other techniques. I'm gonna load up the wet palette here and these colors are colors that are close to or similar to the base colors or the camouflage colors or maybe some of the chipping colors or rust colors. And from this point forward, I'll be doing a lot of brush work, paint brush work. So now starts a round of chipping that's more similar to traditional paint brush chipping. But rather than say chip down to a base color or to the steel color here, what I like to do is start out by finding a color that's similar to the color I'm applying it over and add that. So say it's a green color, I might add a little bit lighter green color and these will indicate light chips or light scuffs, um, just surface imperfections rather than say chips that go through the paint. While I'm chipping, I'm also adding what would be, I guess, a very thin light acrylic filter. So say for instance on these NATO Brown ERA blocks, I might come in with a very thin wash of say an orange color on one block and maybe a beige on another block just to give them a little bit of individuality. Well, speaking of acrylic filters, this is where it gets full on acrylic filters. So once again, I'm filling up the palette and again, it's with colors that are very similar to the colors I've already used for either the camouflage or the base colors. And then in the palette, I'm adding a lot of water to dilute them down. And the basic consistency I'm looking for here is nothing much more than just colored water. The million dollar questions are, what am I doing and why would I be doing this? What I'm doing is adding filters, basically. Um, traditionally, filters are generally with enamels. That's the most common. They can also be done with oils. And yes, I'll be doing oil filters later on, which then leads to the question, why would I be using acrylics to do filtering when other methods are more common and perhaps even easier to manipulate? I started doing this a long time ago, years and years ago. And what I have found, what works for me anyway, is that when I do chipping, whether that be hairspray or with a sponge or with the brush, there's always a little bit of a difference in surface texture no matter how careful you are. And by adding just a little bit of a acrylic color around that or over the surface, the wash, or the in this case, the filter, 
it collects around these little differences in texture and it helps to create a 3D effect for the chips. The secondary effect, of course, is that I can color shift the base colors a little bit by adding slightly different tones of, say, green over green, or the, in this case, a little bit of orange over the NATO brown colors. This is also good for starting a little bit of paint fading by just lightening up the colors slightly, say, with an ivory color within the paint colors. The downside to this technique or doing this type of filtering or washing with acrylic colors is that it's a fairly risky process. That is, if the paint dries or the water dries and there's a ring around it where the paint is, those tide marks, once you have tide marks, you cannot get rid of those. And for that reason, that's why enamels or oils are used for this type of filtering or washes because they're just a lot more forgiving. Now you can add a little bit of dish soap within the water. That helps break the surface tension and helps with those tide marks. But I've never really gotten into that habit. So I've just learned to work quickly and be careful and also work in small spaces. You know, just work on say the front glacius plate or a section of fender at a time. Make sure that that part looks good before moving on to the next part. And you'll probably notice that while I'm doing this, I'm working color by color here. So in terms of, say, the light-colored camouflage bands, I'm using a light color, say the cream or maybe a little bit of the yellows just to kind of shift those colors. And I do the same with the NATO brown by adding a little bit of oranges or maybe a little bit of beige color. And the greens, I'm adding a little bit of, say, a little bit of ivory to lighten the green or even a little bit of yellow just to give it a little bit of a different color tone. At this stage, the acrylic work, the overall like filters and washes, that's pretty much complete. So let's backtrack a little bit and let's catch up on some housekeeping. If you've been following these episodes, you'll have already seen that I've installed Fruil tracks onto this model. Those were assembled a couple of weeks ago. A couple of things when it comes to the Fruil model tracks. First, I've just gotten into the habit of drilling out the holes. I, it's just something that I think this needs to be done every time and I've gotten used to it so I don't mind it so much. Secondly, while it comes with wire to insert between the track links, I've always found that using a piece of stiff wire, some 20,000s, either brass rod or wire, that works the best, and that's what I'm using here. Next comes the time to discolor them, and for that, I'm going to be using AK Metal Burnishing Fluid. And before you write it in the comments, I know I should be using gloves here, but I'm not. Now, having workable tracks is great, but the other wonderful thing about having metal tracks is just how easily that they are weathered and ready to go onto your model. So with the burnishing fluid, I just drop the tracks into a bowl and get them all moistened up and wet. And then I use a toothbrush on a paper towel, and I just make sure that I scrub all that burnishing fluid into all the little areas. With these tracks, after brushing them with the toothbrush, I just let them sit on the paper towel for a few minutes, and then afterwards, I just rinse them off in the sink. Now the tracks are basically the color that I want them to be before being installed on the model. But before doing that, I just take a sanding stick and lightly go over the top of the treads just to bring out the highlights, the polished metal surfaces where it would be in contact with the ground. Then I flip them over and with a little piece of sanding paper, I just polish off the metal teeth, the guide teeth on the tracks as well, just to get them highlighted where the road wheels would be making contact and polishing those. Speaking of the road wheels, I also painted those this week. Super easy method to do that. Use a piece of double-sided tape over a piece of cardboard, paint the road wheels the rubber color you'd like overall, and then using an architectural template or a circle template, I just hold those over the top of the center of the road wheels and spray the center sections with the base color. Then on the drive teeth and also on the idler wheels, on those areas where the tracks would cause friction and polish the metal, I added AK Intense Metal Steel Color to that. And once that paint had dried, I then polished it with um, AK Interactive Dark Steel Pigments just to give it a really nice metallic sheen. And with that, I think we're at a pretty good stopping point for this episode. The next episode will pick up right here where we've left off. It will include working with the oil paints. We'll do a little bit of pigments, uh, some fine brush work just to take care of some of those details. And we'll do the final assembly. Until then, please hit that like and subscribe button and keep on modeling. Take care.